Good morning and welcome to worship this Sunday, the 28th of February, the second Sunday of Lent, as we continue to learn to follow as disciples of Jesus. We meet in the presence of Jesus, who knows our needs, hears our cries, feels our pain and heals our wounds. The word this morning is brought to us by Reverend Rasheen with readings from Barney Hooper and Anne Petty and sung worship led for us by Esther Sardar and Ruth and Paul Beretta. Please join with us in singing our first song together, In Christ Alone, after which we'll hear a short interview with Esther, our new worship leader. Please join with us as we sing together. Here 
Well, I'm um, catching up with Esther Sada, our worship leader, who's recently arrived. I say arrived, she's still in Bristol. Uh, I thought it'd be lovely for us to get to know you a bit more, Esther. Um, so this is kind of an interview, although you've, you've had an interview that you passed with Flying Colours, obviously. Uh, this is a different kind of interview. Just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really, really excited about uh, moving to Camborne and becoming part of what's going on in the Camborne cluster. Yeah, um, I've been a Christian all my life. I suppose you could say that. I gave my life to Jesus quite early on. Um, I was, uh, I'm the fourth child of itinerant ministers. And uh, so we traveled quite a lot. Um, and I gave my life to Jesus very young. Um, and have always felt quite called to ministry. Um, and that has come out a lot in music um, and in songwriting. So a lot of my earlier days was spent in uh, uh, writing songs or writing songs from scripture, things that I've learnt. Um, the way that I learnt it best was through music. Um, and yeah, I've been involved in church pretty much since I could walk. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that's about me summed up really. Worship, worship, worship. <laughs> well, I'm putting you on the spot here a bit. We say worship, worship, worship. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what, what does worship mean for you? Mm. It's been a journey. Um, growing up, I thought worship was the songs that we sung. Um, I've come from quite a charismatic background. Uh, uh, I was growing up around the renewal time, um, part of the New Frontiers International Group. And uh, I had some real, uh, real encounters, let's call them, with God at that time. And, uh, but what I had in front of me, the worship we had was always music. And there was a real uh, flow where you could really express yourself in that, in that which suited me down to the ground because I'm a bit of a creative and I'm very expressive and I love that. Um, but one of the things growing up I, I realised over time is that actually what my worship is, is my relationship with God. Um, you know, I, I, I believe what we've all, we all are worshippers. We either worship God or we worship something else um, and whatever it is. And, uh, and I believe that actually worship isn't just the songs we sing, but it, it's about our lifestyle, about our choices, about how we do life, what we prioritize, um, because all of that will either exalt and glorify God or it will glorify something in our life that we consider really important. Um, one of the scriptures that has always stayed with me is uh, John chapter four. I don't know if everyone knows it. It's, it's about the woman at the well when Jesus meets that Samaritan woman. And uh, in his conversation, he's at the well and he actually says, well, a time is coming when we're going to worship God, not on this mountain or in this place. So not in a no location, but actually we're going to worship him in spirit and truth. And he said that we're going to worship the father. So when, when we think about our fathers what we're talking that that immediately signifies a relationship and so um this relationship that we have uh with our heavenly father is a work in progress it's a it's a work of trust it's a work of learning how to discern what the holy spirit is doing in our lives and how he's leading us um which means we need to be prayerful and mindful of him um in everything we do I think the biggest training ground for me in terms of my relationship and my worship filled life hasn't been in my songwriting. It's actually been in how I've been a parent to my children, how I've chosen to raise them, um, how I've taught them that maybe some of the priorities of this day and age are not godly and what God has to say about things. And as a re my responsibility has been to live a life to the best of my ability, which is not perfect by any means, uh, and which is completely hopelessly flawed. Um, but I always uphold God's standard. 
And I, I try to walk that standard before them and lead by example. And so I'm actually living a lifestyle of worship before my children. Um, and and that's, the, that's part of my worship life. So I, I would really say that um, worship is, is everything. It's, it's relationship. It's how we connect with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's how we choose to do life. And then there are many expressions of that. And one of those, for me especially, is songwriting or singing. Um, that is how I connect with God. And it's expression of something that's already been happening during the week. It's a response to what he's done in my life on a daily basis. Wow. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Esther. That's, that's wonderful. And we're really looking forward to you arriving uh, in Camborne and, uh, and, and worshipping with us down here. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Pleasure. And as we continue to live our lives of worship as worship laid out before God, let us confess our sins to God. Lord, you've made us for relationship. And you call us into one family as sisters and brothers. We acknowledge our need for connection and our dependence on one another. Forgive our independence and our pride, which have kept us apart from each other. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you long for the day when love conquers all. You call us to love one another as you have loved us. Forgive our carelessness, our stubbornness, our lovelessness. Christ, have mercy. Lord, you long for the day when your son Jesus comes to rule and reign. Forgive our lack of vision our blindness to the signs of your coming kingdom and our blinkeredness to the needs of others. Lord, have mercy. So may the God of all healing and hope and mercy draw you to himself, forgive you your sins, and may you know the newness of life in Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is their violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, 
who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our The Gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the Holy Angel. My dog has taught me a lot. He's taught me a lot about remaining optimistic. He always lives in hope of a treat or a dropped piece of food from the dinner table. And despite numerous times when he gets nothing, he remains hopeful. He's taught me a lot about remaining faithful to his master. When we go for a walk through the woods, he likes to dash off into the trees and chase squirrels. But it always comes back to the path. And I'll be honest, there are times when my heart is in my mouth and I think he's gone too long and I worry about where the nearest busy road is. And I'll call him and I'll whistle, and I'll look for any sign of movement, and then suddenly he'll appear back on the path. My dog isn't good all the time, but he's always faithful. And there have been times when God has shown me something in particular through my dog's behaviour. There was a time when we lived in Rochester shortly after I'd experienced my calling into ministry. And I'd been agonising over what to do, whether to do nothing or to respond and take a step into a whole new direction. So I went for a long walk down by the river with the dog to think things through and to pray. Now, the other thing you need to know about our dog is he likes carrying sticks, the bigger, the better and we used to house the National Stick Collection. He loves to carry a big stick and bring them home. And on this occasion, he found a particularly large beam of wood. I was really distracted by my thoughts and he was trying to get his jaw around this piece of wood and he was picking it up and dropping it again and he kept whining at me. I just looked at him and thought, I can't do anything, just leave it if you can't pick it up. But he kept at it, trying to get purchase and whining and complaining. And I began to realise that God was trying to show me something. And these words came very clearly to the front of my mind. Stop whining, pick up your cross and follow me. These words of Jesus, which we heard today in Mark's Gospel, verse 34 of chapter 8. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. But what does that actually mean? Many of us have heard it before in church around this time of year, but can we actually make sense of it? Remember, the disciples didn't know 
that Jesus was going to be crucified. So what did they think of it when they heard it for the first time? Why was he talking about carrying crosses? But first, he asks his listeners to deny themselves. Just before Jesus made this statement, he had been asking his closest followers who they thought he was. It was a key point in his ministry, a key point in their understanding of who Jesus was. And Peter is the one to recognise who Jesus really is. He is the Messiah, the anointed one. But Jesus himself knows that he must deny and set aside all of that in order to save humanity. He puts to one side his true identity, choosing not to avoid suffering and rejection. He denies all claim to divinity, knowing that this will open the gate of life to all. And in the end, reveal who he truly is. Secondly, he asks his listeners to take up their cross. Now, all around them were Romans dishing out crucifixion as a form of punishment for political rebels and criminals. To be carrying a cross is to be carrying a death sentence. That person will no longer be recognised for who they are, but rather for what they've done. This makes me think that Jesus is asking his followers to be prepared to be labelled not by their name, but by the cross they are carrying. If we carry a cross, wear it on a chain around our neck or as a lapel pin, are we prepared to be recognised as Christians? Lastly, Jesus invites his followers to follow him. As I listen to Jesus' words today, I find it reassuring that Jesus never asked us to be good. He asks us to be faithful. Jesus knows that we can't be good all of the time. It is a human weakness and we regularly give in to temptation and make mistakes. Jesus himself was tempted, as we heard in the Gospel reading from Mark last week, when he was in the wilderness. And we read it here again, when the words of temptation come through Peter, telling him not to go through with it all, seeing only the risks his friend was taking and not the divine plan. St Paul tries to explain it in his letter to the Romans, that Abraham didn't receive God's grace because he'd been well behaved, far from it. No, he received God's promises because it was his faith that counted. And Paul says it's the same for us. Our faith will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The invitation to follow Jesus is just as much for us today as it was for those first listeners back then. It is a call to be faithful and to trust his leading. It doesn't mean temptations won't come along. It doesn't mean there won't be times of wilderness for that matter. It doesn't mean we have to face these things on our own. In fact, if you remember last week's reading, we see Jesus goes into the wilderness equipped with the Holy Spirit from his baptism. We too can be equipped with that same Holy Spirit. Isn't that remarkable? It is the same Holy Spirit who was with Jesus, who promises to be with us through our wilderness, such as our present experience of lockdown, and through temptations in the season of Lent and beyond. Stood by the river that day, I realised that what I was being asked to do was nowhere near what was being asked of Jesus when he picked up his cross. 
When my dog finally managed to pick up that stick and run with it, I realised I needed to stop whining and get on with it too. This Lent, we are we prepared to swap our self-seeking for satisfaction, for dreams of higher things? Are we willing to be counted as Christians, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus? Some of us may have only just started following Jesus. Some of us have been following him for years, but perhaps wandered off the pathway or sat down for a rest. I encourage you, wherever you are on your journey, to remain faithful, to remember who you belong to and to listen for the Master's voice. Seek the Holy Spirit to strengthen you, to take the next step, because this is the way to life. Amen. Amen. Indeed. Thank you so much, Roisin, for those wonderful, encouraging words this morning. As we continue to reflect on what God is saying to us this morning, I've asked Esther to lead us in a couple of songs. Lead me to the cross and cornerstone. You may not know the songs, but let the words uh, wash over you. Listen and reflect and pause as you hear God drawing you closer to himself.
God, at the moment, things are looking a little dark. And sometimes it's quite hard to see you. So grateful that we have glimpses of hope. Thank you, Lord God, that you're there for us. Even when we can't see you, you're there. We remember that you are our cornerstone. You're our refuge, you're our strength. You're our very present help in time of need. And we choose to come in our worship right now and abide under the shadow of the Almighty right here and right now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I'll wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ my cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love and through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds
help us pray this morning. I've come out for a walk. I love praying outside, love praying outside while I'm walking. On my state sanctioned walk today. But wherever you may best pray, I urge you to try and do so. I've got some items with me to help me pray. One is a bunch of keys. Now, whether you're at home or whether you're able to go out for a walk, hold your keys as you pray. And the other thing I've got is a small cross, just a key ring. This cross was given to me by a friend from Hong Kong. As we hold our keys, remember this time of lockdown where we can't get out and about as much as we want to. This time where we feel locked in. This time of restriction. But the healing that that also allows for our community. We're helping one another through those restrictions. As we hold our keys, we thank God for every promise unlocked for us in Jesus. We thank God for the hope that this year may yet bring. We thank God that he holds the keys to our future. The keys that we need. Keys remind us as well of treasure boxes. Of secret gardens. Keys remind us of things yet unseen and unknown. Lord God, reveal to us these things in this time. As we hold on to the cross, we remember those words this morning. Take up your cross and follow me. Help us, loving Father, to take up the cross of Jesus. An ancient prayer of the church linked to Lent and Easter time and the way of the cross is simply this. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. We pray that together. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. As we hold on to our keys, we remember key workers, all those on all the front lines at the moment. We pray for medical staff, for doctors and nurses and all in the hospitals, our GPs. We thank God for the army of volunteers helping with the vaccinations at the moment. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. We thank God for key workers of all places, for the ones that take away our rubbish, for key workers in shops, key workers who are electricians and plumbers, key workers who are teachers. And as we hold on to our keys, we remember them in prayer. Holy God, 
holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. The Collect, the Church's Prayer for Today. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings, and by following in his way, come to share in his glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join with us as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please join with us as we sing our final hymn together, The Servant King, led for us this morning by Ruth and Paul Beretta. From heaven you came, helpless babe.
thank you Ruth and Paul for leading us in that way. So let us learn how to serve and in our lives enthrone him. Each other's needs to prefer, for it is Christ we're serving. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, to take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen.